pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Knight, who leads our HSRD program at the VA, to introduce our next speaker. Sarah. Thank you very much, Ken, and thank you, everyone, and welcome uh, to the seminar. Um, I'd like to, it's a great honor to introduce um, Dr. Amy Kilborn. Um, Amy has at least uh, five jobs right now, um, but I'm going to tell you about just some of the important ones. Uh, actually, they're all very important and um, demanding jobs. Uh, Amy is the director of the Quality Enhancement Research Initiative, or many of you may know it as the Query Program in the VA, which is um, a national program uh, focusing on implementation science. She's also a professor of psychiatry at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor um, in the medical school, and she's associate director for implementation and policy in the um, at University of Michigan Depression Center. She's also director of the Michigan Mental Health Integration Partnership. Um, and in addition to that, she is currently acting director of health services research in the VA nationally as well. Um, I want to mention a, a few things about um, Amy um, that are significant and, and really describe her wide ranging uh, knowledge and skill sets. Um, Amy had um, uh, received her bachelor's degree at the University of California at Berkeley uh, with a double major in microbiology and rhetoric. Um, she has a master's in epidemiology from the University of California at Los Angeles and also a PhD in uh, health policy from UCLA as well. Um, she's been the recipient of several very prestigious awards um, including the uh, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, or the PCASE Award. Um, and um, I also want to just, on a personal note, um, I worked with Amy in Washington, D.C. when I was in central office of the VA. We had offices next to each other, and it was, a, it was really a wonderful opportunity to have Amy as a research leadership partner. I value her friendship and uh, collaboration. Um, and I uh, welcome Amy to our seminar. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. And I hope everyone can hear me okay. This, great. Great. And it's really great to be here. This is my first time in the state of Alabama, and I need to get down here more often. I've heard a lot of great places I need to visit down here, so I guess I'll be coming back. So I'm going to talk about where we are with implementation science. And before I do that, how many of you are clinicians? Just raise your hands. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to actually just set the stage with a couple of definitions. And I do this because I work in both the worlds of quality improvement and implementation science. So I think of implementation, or I think of quality improvement as involving the analysis of healthcare performance and systematic efforts to re uh, re improve it. So essentially just sort of general idea of improving the care that we deliver. Implementation science involves the study of the use of theory-based strategies to help frontline providers adopt and integrate effective clinical practices or evidence-based practices into routine clinical care. But they both have a common goal, although there are sort of our separate lines of thinking, and that is to really be able to get more frontline providers implementing evidence-based practices off the academic shelf into the hands of patients. And this is really where I think the challenge is, but also some of the greatest opportunities and actually some of the most fun types of research to do. Because what happens to many effective practices? So if you remember from Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, he's the hero, he gets the art, it's great, it's wonderful, but at the end of the scene, this is the final scene where it just sort of gets shelved off somewhere. So think of this as your research. You spend so much blood, sweat, and tears getting your research out there, your discoveries, and then only to have it on the academic shelf and whether or not it was implemented nationwide or even locally, it's hard, you know, sometimes hard to do. And that's because we got to think about this in, from the frontline provider perspectives. That's why I wanted to ask, you know, how many of you are clinicians and whether or not this relates to you. So this words of wisdom from Winnie the Pooh. Here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now, bump, 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 on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way coming downstairs. But sometimes he feels that there really is another way, if only he could stop bumping for a moment and think about it. 
So this is how we feel as data clinic clinicians, just wanting to do the right thing, improve quality, and yet having to have something added, one more thing to our plates, you know, another thing to implement, another best practice to utilize. And where implementation science and quality improvement come in is that there is that better way. We just have to sort of take a step back and think about it more if we have the time. And why is this important? This is the state of US healthcare now. I mean, debate, debates about insurance and healthcare have been going on for years, but it's really about taking care of people with chronic conditions and mental health issues. There's a high burden of chronic conditions and a high cost associated with them. There's a high degree of fragmentation. I feel passionately about implementation science as someone in a department of psychiatry because mental health in, in, in many respects is sort of that final frontier. You are trying to basically integrate and combine services from people who essentially got training in completely different areas. And it's not only physicians, you have social workers, you have psychologists, you have nurses, you have um, essentially peer support specialists. You have all sorts of different types, and you have people in the social services sector uh, trying to help these folks and trying to work together to do that. At the same time, we only have half of US residents rece receiving effective care, and for mental health conditions, only a third receive minimally adequate treatment. This is also becoming a crisis in a population level. I don't know if anyone um, remembers seeing the article about a year and a half ago in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Um, this was an article showing that the rising mortality rates among lower class individuals or lower to middle class individuals um, was actually rising, particularly for um, working class whites. And what was, I think, striking about it was it was reversing a, a nationwide trend where mortality was actually going down, but then it started going up again. And this was um, a paper that was published by Ann Case and Angus Deaton in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that also attributed to this rising mortality of preventable causes. And if you think about it, it's essentially a, the poisonings from the opioid addictions and also the liver disease and, and also suicides. And it's not surprising that the VA's top priority now in the Department of Veterans Affairs is this sort of trifecta between substance use, suicide, and opioid abuse, and trying to deal with them all three at once. So this is a, a crisis nationwide, and especially in our VA, that we need to deal with it. And so I think, and also, and I think, if you think about it, even outside the VA healthcare system nationally, and you think about the issues in Medicaid, these are the top conditions that are um, causes for readmissions, and four of the 10 conditions are mental health related, which is why, again, I'm going to have a, a particular focus on mental health conditions in my talk about implementation science and the, and the types of strategies to use. So getting back, getting back to sort of the reason for implementation science, and we saw this roadmap earlier, I think, um, on a couple of the slides, but stood to always recap. You have the T1 and T2 types of knowledge, you know, essentially the translational knowledge. And, and again, where we are with implementation science is basically taking that knowledge into routine practice. It's really how to do it. It's the how to. And implementation science doesn't have to really just be about theories that we have to run away from. You know, I get kind of my eyes glaze over when I see another theory or framework. It's about taking that framework, making it come alive, having to, having to figure out what you can do to give the providers the tools to use effective practices to reduce those mortality rates that are, that are really uh, happening. So we also do know, and why we need implementation science, is that best practices are not routinely implemented. We have 80% of medical research dollars don't result in public health impact. We have a lot of reasons for that, and there's uh, definitely reasons at the organizational and provider levels. And you have, for every one dollar, you get a value of 20 cents, and then you have this essentially this bottleneck where a lot of these practices don't get implemented and you essentially have less than 10 cents on the dollar actually getting implemented. And I have to thank my colleague, Mark Bauer at, um, at the uh, VA um, Center of Innovation in Boston for this slide. So this is how we often think about our research careers. So the point of doing the research is to do more research. So yeah, we have to do something about this research, don't we? <laughs> So what do we do? So why do we care about implementation science? And it's not just for theorists, it's actually for real world people. Because of the learning healthcare system movement, we just heard about this from, from Paul and Adrian and others. So I think just to recap, there was a National Academy of Medicine, formerly Institute of Medicine report that came out in 2012 that basically outlined a framework for what is a learning healthcare system. So this is sort of my English version of what I think they 
um, sort of distilled from this report was leverage existing big data to deploy and evaluate innovations faster and cheaper, be able to actually evaluate do comparative effectiveness studies and not have to survey patients using three hour surveys. Aligning the science though with the clinical priority goals of the healthcare system. So actually doing some research that the healthcare system leaders really want to utilize and put back and that's the implementation piece conduct more rapid and efficient studies. But here's the challenge, and this is why we need implementation scientists at all, spe all le levels of the spectrum. Learning healthcare system conversations I've had mostly have been about the data. They focused on how to get the data. That is important. Data standardization is absolutely vital. We have a query center in San Francisco. It's all they do is data standardization with OMOP. That's their goal. But we need also, in addition to that, quality improvement strategies to take that data and package it to providers so they understand what's going on or what's not going on and be able to tweak and improve practice on a day-to-day -day basis. The missing piece are the, um, the quality improvement strategies. Why do we need quality improvement strategies? Because there are, I would say, four different types of major barriers often facing the day-to-day -day pra practitioners when they really want to do the right thing and implement these wonderful interventions and these best practices. We have quality gaps across systems. So you may have an early, a bunch of you may have a couple of early adopter sites which you want to start with, which is great, but the majority of sites and majority of practices out there don't have the, um, oftentimes the resources or the leadership to be able to, to sort of take on, take the helm and say, hey, we're going to do this best practice, this evidence-based intervention. Providers have competing demands. I mean, would, do you, you know, in a, in a sense, in terms of quality improvement strategies, it's always about adding something to their plate. We're also talking about de-implementation strategies and more recently in query about how do we actually take things off their plate. And then limited external validity. We have these wonderful randomized clinical trials and of course the, the uh, work that's going to be done with PCORnet and other places are going to change that, but small select patient samples. They don't look like the patients you really see. And then the misalignment with organizations and policies. So you can have this wonderful line of research in one area that's very important but might be too specific Whereas the VA, for example, may be saying, hey, we need some research on best practices for curbing the opioid addiction. So, but you've been focusing on another area more specific. And it's not your fault, but it's just essentially aligning the right type of intervention at the right time with the right priorities. So the ways in which we can reduce that ball neck are really in four different ways. Thinking about quality improvement or implementation strategies in lower resourced sites so taking that intervention that you have, that wonderful intervention and adapting it so that a site in rural places can actually use it. In addition, thinking about strategies for provider engagement, and I'll go into what types of implementation strategies really work at that provider self-efficacy and motivation to help them adopt evidence-based practices. Have treatments that actually generalize to let's say more rural sites or inner city sites and to have actually the ability to use big data to actually monitor in a valid way to scale up and spread of these evidence-based practices. So that's what we hope to do. Quality improvement strategies. This is really the crux of why we study implementation science. Implementation science is a multidisciplinary field. It has recently also been really evolving to be part of the quality improvement movement and some of the lean work that's been done in hospitals as well but it's really a multidisciplinary field in, in many ways and it makes it exciting. But the goal of implementation science is to create strategies that are highly specified systematic processes used and tested often at a clinic or system level to help providers implement effective practices. So most of our interventions we've probably worked with are about patient level interventions. Implementation strategies are provider level interventions or team based or team level interventions to help those providers actually implement the type of interventions you want them to use. So the difference and it really this is really the distinction between T1 and T2 research versus the implementation T3 and T4 is when you're doing efficacy trials, you control the providers, you are basically training those providers and those providers work for you. The way, when you know you're doing an implementation study when you're actually working with community-based providers who don't have, who are not under your leadership, who are not under your rubric of, of, uh, su of supervising, and you're basically needing to train them in order to implement your effective practice in routine care. And that sort of, 
um, sort of arm's length is key to why we need implementation strategies. Providers are not going to always do what you tell them to do, and that's probably important because they have competing demands, they may have other worries, and they may have other needs as well. It's implementation of science is about aligning what the frontline providers' competing demands are with what you can do in your clinical intervention. So these are examples of some implementation or quality improvement strategies used um, particularly in our quality enhancement research initiative program. So Query is a national network of about 15 centers now, and I think we're also up to about an additional 15 what I call smaller partnered evaluation centers. But these 15 centers are around the country, and their goal is to be laboratories for testing different quality improvement strategies. They actually range in terms of um, simple and easy to use in terms of relatively low cost, heavy focus on training, provider training, like replicating effective programs, which originated from the CDC, or academic detailing, to more complex types of implementation or quality improvement strategies that really involve a lot of work at the bottom up with frontline providers and leadership. And the, I would say one of the pinnacle examples is uh, Lisa Rubenstein's evidence-based quality improvement, which is really a combination of rigorous training as well as packaging and, and manualization of an intervention with actual lean principles like doing plan, do, study, act cycles or doing using data and creating registries to do day-to-day -day quality improvement inside the clinic. So it's much more intensive where you have a consultant working with those frontline providers to get something implemented in routine care. And there are other types of implementation strategies you may have heard about. Community engagement is one. Um, the Ken Wells and Loretta Jones use community engagement to scale up and spread depression treatment interventions in greater LA. That's a type of implementation strategy that involves involving community members. Learning collaboratives are also very popular for in, particularly in types of psychosocial interventions. And then facilitation and unlearning are really popular for areas where you're trying to get, get providers to work together on decision making and especially for lung cancer screening or other types of, of procedures that do require some clinical decision making. So I'm going to talk about the implementation or I would say quality improvement implementation research roadmap and, and how this is sort of a way of framing how to think about getting from your effectiveness studies, your efficacy studies, your observational studies to um, implementation studies. And, and this, this roadmap is really a more of a, not only a heuristic for thinking about your own research trajectory, I'll give you an example of what we've done in our team, but also as a way of thinking about how to actually approach this when you talk to a health system leader in general. You first wanna start with identifying what the gaps are and what are some of the most important gaps from the perspective of the, net, of the leaders of the healthcare system. That's where you get your big data, embedding and getting your big data and figuring out where, where are the gaps in quality. Determine then what drives that variation in quality, study the positive deviance, identify effective practices. The third stage is deploying quality improvement strategies. That's where you basically understand from parts one and two to get to the point, okay, what do I do? Learning from those positive deviance, learning from the best practices and taking that and sort of essentially bottling it and try to uh, figure out what the secret sauce is and that's the implementation strategy and then help other frontline providers implement that effective practice. So I'll talk about this in a context of quality of medical care for chronic mental disorders. So this is an example from our studies that we've done by our research team about 10 years ago. And we presented this at, to uh, leadership at the University of Pittsburgh. And basically at the time there was a concern about under diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And we made a concern front and center by showing that in the VA healthcare system, people with bipolar disorder were racking up a lot of diagnoses for chronic medical conditions. So oftentimes the focus was just on their, essentially their mental health issues, but we told them we need to focus on their physical health issues. Bipolar disorder being one of the serious mental illness in a serious mental illness family is also associated with a, almost a 25 year re reduction or years of potential life loss due to these types of chronic medical conditions, especially hypertension, diabetes, the ones that are also um, essentially attributed to heart disease. So we made this front and center as our argument why we need to have a focus area in bipolar disorder. So we showed leadership at the time, there was a gap in outcomes and it was attributed to these chronic medical conditions. We also showed there's a gap in the quality of care received by people with bipolar disorder in the VA region that we worked in. 
And the gap primarily was not in terms of medications, which were relatively easy to dispense, and this is in the VA, but it was the post-hospitalization visits. But we found that actually to mediate or to sort of mitigate that gap, we were able to do phone contacts for visits. And so the disparities between African-Americans and whites in terms of uh, fewer African-Americans getting a post-hospitalization visit actually disappeared if you counted phone contacts. And so they tried to use more telephone contacts and then we found out that was a little bit better for people with transportation issues. So we had a gap in quality, we had a potential solution to it. So we figured, okay, what do we do to build a best practice around getting people engaged in their care after hospitalization? So that got to our next step. So we dug into research and did literature reviews and found the, uh, really the folks out in the Washington at Group Health at the time developed the collaborative chronic care model. And we found, gee, you know, it's a great model to be able to proactively identify people at risk and manage their chronic illness. So we identified the use of effective practices. So what we did was we took the chronic care model and we adapted it. And we basically, and this is a definition of, in sort of in, again in English, what chronic care model is supposed to do. It uses clinical data to monitor patients, tailor appropriate treatment, and self-management strategies. I always think that learning healthcare system models sort of the chronic care models are blown up or on steroids. Essentially, it's the same idea, using data, proactively identify who's in trouble, help them, and try to build in some sustainable self-management or, or quality improvement for these individuals. A meta-analysis of chronic care model studies for mental disorders back in 2012 showed significant clinical improvements in both physical and mental health outcomes, and for the most part, at a, a little to no net cost. The cost, though, was over a three-year period, cost neutrality. So that was a little hard to sell to some of the insurance companies, but we were able to sell it to large health systems like the VA. So we adapted this model to help people with bipolar disorder at the time, and we've expanded it since to other mental disorders. But we started with bipolar illness, given the leadership desire to look at that at the University of Pittsburgh. So we created guidelines that focused on cardiovascular risk factors for people with bipolar disorder for their general medical as well as mental health providers. We created a care management physician description, uh, description that focused on registry tracking and general medical provider liaison work and sort of alerting providers if something was wrong. And we had that care manager provide self-management psychotherapy that focused on tailored psychotherapy around understanding your symptoms, but how to actually use exercise and diet control as ways of coping with the symptoms. So the marriage between sort of your generic wellness, behavior change work with the idea, hey, it can also help your bipolar symptoms. The program was called Life Goals at the time. So we found that in over seven RCTs with 1,200 participants, we showed that we were able with this program to reduce depressive symptoms and improve health-related quality of life. We also showed in one study that it also reduced blood pressure. In this study, this was a national study focused on the National Network of Depression Centers. In six months, we saw a clinically significant decrease in the PHQ-9 scores as well. And it ended up being a national, in a national registry of evidence-based practices in SAMHSA. I want to sort of step aside, though, and talk about another area of positive, in, in use of positive deviance. So you heard about the collaborative care model, which was really one study, one type of intervention. But what do you have a bunch of interventions in a health system and you want to pick the best ones? This is an example of, of how you can actually manage and get the best ideas from positive deviance in a national health care system like the VA. This program is called the Diffusion of Excellence and it was launched two years ago in the VA as a means to get frontline providers to actually compete to get the best ideas around essentially putting in their best practices. And then essentially there was a media platform, a social media platform for them to apply and say, I have this best practice in pharmacy management or I have this best practice in health behavior change. Then the top 40 were selected and then subject matter experts in the VA nationally narrowed it down to the top 20. The top 20 went through a virtual VA shark tank that was actually managed by, I would say, about half a dozen VA national leaders. These were regional leaders. These were essentially the uh, health plan leaders who essentially bid on which of the best practices that they would implement at their site. So they had to put money on the table and say, I will invest in your best practice if you can come and help us implement it at our site. So this was a, a brilliant program. Um, the developer of it was Sharif El Nahal, and who's now the um, Director of Quality, Safety, and Value in the VA at the time. Uh, we're also conducting an inquiry and evaluation of this program to better understand how to do this in other healthcare systems as well. 
So these are kind of the kind of an example of the types of promising practices that got implemented through this Shark Tank program in about a couple of years ago. So what resulted was, was from this was everything from procedural best practices, such as direct access to audiology and, and optometry appointments, as opposed to doing going through frontline provider uh, primary care provider gatekeeping. There also was um, a couple of them involving um, nurse care management visits and pharmacy care management. So a lot of them were kind of, I would say, simple tweaks to an administrative process or an information system, but some of them were also involving coordinated care like the chronic care model, but more streamlined. So we have these best practices, the chart change, we have the, you know, the studies, but you can build all this infrastructure. And then we often, we assume we build these things and say, okay, we're ready to implement, let's do it. And then we have to then think about the psychology around implementation science and actually quality improvement. There's a psychology to this, scale up and spread. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to think about what are some quality improvement strategies we can use to implement the collaborative care model for mood disorders, for mental disorders. So we picked two of them because we like them in terms of how, what they were focusing on. Replicating effective programs is a quality improvement strategy that focuses on provider training and getting provider buy-in at the beginning. Facilitation is maintaining that provider buy-in throughout the process by which you're trying to get them to implement your, your favorite best practice. So we did a multi-site randomized trial in Michigan and Colorado. And we compared the effectiveness of rep training focus, frontline provider in, a, in the beginning focused with um, rep plus ongoing facilitation to see if the added cost of facilitation made a difference in the uptake of a current care model for bipolar disorder. We looked at the number of collaborative care sessions, which were really an important indicator of whether or not the collaborative care model was being sustained, and of course, some patient outcomes as well. So this is a model. These are the quality improvement strategies as they appear. Replicating effective programs is really front-loaded front -loaded around getting frontline providers, the clinicians involved at the beginning. There is a stakeholder input process where you talk to frontline providers and ask them, you know, what. What are some of your pain points? How can we resolve these? What are your barriers? And adapting an effective practice to address those barriers and basically ensuring that those frontline providers own that collaborative care model, it becomes their model. The implementation phase is, is standard training and technical assistance and ongoing monitoring, but we added in the external facilitation in the ongoing implementation phase. The pinnacle is the dissemination phase, the outcomes assessments over time, the business case, and the future diffusion and spread. REP was developed to rapidly expand and disseminate HIV prevention interventions back in the 90s in order to curb the rising epidemic of HIV. It's based on social learning theory and Rogers diffusion model. The emphasis is again on the fidelity and frontline provider buy-in at the beginning. The QI strategy facilitation is, is really coming from mainly the literatures of both quality improvement and also organizational psychology. And that tends to come from areas such as self-efficacy and motivational interviewing. It's kind of interesting how it works that way. So essentially, REP allows for provider ownership of the quality improvement process by adapting and deploying the evidence-based practices, mitigating potential for drift. Why do you care about this? Because people often say, oh yeah, I do integrated care. Oh yeah, I'm doing a chronic care model. And so I always give this analogy, is it a car? So if you look at all these four things, you can call something different, but they all have the same functions. They all kind of look like different things, but you know, you can probably argue, one could argue a car has wheels, an engine, a steering wheel, you know. You, you would argue, you know, you would probably say all these are different types of cars. But the question is, is this a car? <laughs> so this is where, you know, again, it gets to, oh yeah, I'm doing integrated care. I'm doing, you know, I'm doing travel care models. And you know, you kind of have to look underneath the hood to see exactly what's going on. And it's not their fault. It's just that, you know, we, we, get, we get married to our labels. You know, we like to say we're a learning healthcare system. We like to say we're, we're doing collaborative care, but you just really want to probe a little bit more. So, enhanced rep adds facilitation because there's that ongoing point where you might have drift. So people may start all excited. They're going to do the collaborative care model. They have their care manager. They have their registry. But then over time, things, you know, competing demands eat up time and things happen. So standard rep, these are the elements, these are the quality improvement strategy elements of standard rep. Think of this as a intervention for providers. 
you kind of know what you're going to give them. Rep plus external facilitation included a phone call about on a regular basis by a facilitator, someone who is an expert in the actual intervention that they're trying to implement and also an expert in, in implementation science. They did a needs assessment, talked to the provider, got to know them. This provider often was a mental health provider, a social worker at the VA, for example, in, in charge of implementing a new program. Help to build local, local support for that social worker, for that frontline provider. Hey, how can you talk to your mental health clinically? Here's some talking points. Here's how you can show it's a win-win for your clinic. Identifying problems and barriers. Oh, I see you don't have enough room to hold self-management sessions. Let's think about, let's think creatively about where to have that conference room or what conference rooms you can use. Identifying and problem solving and, and having an action plan. And then also providing that opportunity. Hey, you may want to feed this, um, positive uh, change back to your leadership, or here's some talking points to use. So a lot of good coaching, a lot of good consultation going on. With facilitation, we found essentially that rep plus facilitation was more effective in terms of number of self-management sessions, number of self um, and care management contacts. And we also showed that it actually led to reduction in the number of ER visits as well, which was, was kind of a surprise secondary finding. But the scale up and spread of quality improvement strategies also needed to ha ha happen in the VA on a national level. So we did, what we did in the VA most recently was um, used rep and facilitation to help implement re-engage. Re-engage is a virtual program. It's kind of a virtual uh, brief care management program. This is one of the four studies that we did on homelessness. This was the one focused on prevention of homelessness. And this was, I think, Stefan, you had one of the uh, first studies as well. This was a national study that determined among VA sites, not initially responding to a standard implementation strategy rep, the effect of adding facilitation immediately versus delayed to see if the re-engage program would have, it, have improved uptake. This was a two-arm cluster randomized trial. This wasn't done nationally. These are, this was also done for sites not responding to reps. So we took out the early adopters. They're doing great, wonderful, we'll monitor you over time. But we really were focusing on 89 sites that were just not implementing re-engage care management whatsoever. Re-engage was a care management program designed for veterans with serious mental illness at risk of homelessness because they had dropped out of care and then not been seen for at least a year. So remember when we talked about serious mental illness being associated with cardiovascular disease, you need to bring these folks back into the clinic. I mean, they have most likely have a lot of different chronic conditions. The mental health provider, usually a social worker psychologist, was asked to they dial a list of veterans who had not been seen for at least a year to go and find their latest contact information, attempt to contact them and schedule an appointment for care if they needed it, and then document all this on a web-based registry. This was a study design of re-engage. So the non-responsive sites, 89 sites, were then randomized to get enhanced rep or continue with the standard rep. And then after six months, the sites that had the standard rep got the enhanced rep with the facilitation. So everyone got something at the end of the day. But what it showed was that essentially, even in six months, and it took about three months to sort of kick in the facilitation, we had improved uptake of the re-engage program, primarily in attempted contacts and updated documentation. So having, again, getting that big data and actually seeing in real time, providers actually updating their registry with information and populating it with information about these patients was a sign to us. That was our sign of essentially the program was being used. And it also was fairly cheap. It was basically seven, about less than eight hours per site for a six month dose of facilitation. It wasn't that much more expensive, um, which was great because it was virtual. And again, so we had some you know, movement but you can see, though, we still had about a, a close to 50% of sites actually not implementing the re-engaged care management program. So again, these are one that this is sort of at the cheaper end of quality improvement strategies, rep and facilitation are relatively cheap. You know, getting into the sites that are still more recalcitrant or have more barriers, you're going to need something more intense. So is external facilitation enough? We were, phone, we were doing a lot of these phone calls of facilitators. We found that it wasn't. We found that again, half of the sites were still not responding. Um, we needed an internal agent to basically be at the side, physically at, located at that, uh, at that site to help that frontline provider and engage with leadership. So then we in, in basically developed the Enhanced Rep 2.0, which not only included a, an external facilitator, 
but internal facilitation. And this was really bringing in principles of lean and principles of quality improvement. Essentially, it was an on-site provider who basically was a clinical manager with direct reporting line to leadership and protected time to basically be a quality improvement officer to implement clinical workflow improvements that would enhance the uptake of the intervention itself. So they worked on, they, they were the people you picked in your clinic that got things done. But the key was they were not the champions of the intervention you're trying to implement. Otherwise, it would just be, oh, you're the poster child for life goals, or you're the poster child for collaborative care. They were seen as sort of the neutral third party, but the not an advocate, but a, essentially a facilitator to help those frontline providers who were enthusiastic about implementing collaborative care, but they were also um, had the ear of leadership. Internal facilitators, you can know them when you see them. I have, it's hard to sort of, exp this is the best way of explaining them. But we did this study then, we expanded our study, this is outside the VA, but we wanted to study this in community-based practices in Michigan and Colorado. So we essentially designed a, 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 essentially a sequential multiple assignment randomized trial for this. Implementation science is one of those types of sciences where you can do a study like with a smart trial because essentially you don't want to waste the expensive time and resources implementing at sites that are already going to do the work, you know, they're early adopters. You want to get to those later adopters. And using a smart trial design, you can get to those later adopters. So among sites not initially responding to REP to implement a collaborative care model, sites receiving external and internal facilitation together versus sites getting an external facilitator phone call alone would have improved 12-month patient outcomes and improved uptake of collaborative care. So this is our ongoing study. We have essentially using this smart design and smart designs have primarily been used in clinical trials for patient treatments. This is one of the first times it's been used for an implementation for a quality improvement strategy. The treatment options, quote unquote, are the implementation strategies, the quality improvement strategies. They're restricted based on the responsiveness of the site. So if the site is not doing anything in collaborative care, they get randomized. If the site is basically, and we're monitoring it using web-based registries, if they're doing collaborative care, then we leave them alone. So it's really the informed development of a sequencing of what implementation strategies you would use to ratchet up to sites that would be increasingly needing the resources, the time, and, and so forth, because they're more of the later adopter sites. So this is our smart design that we are um, in, in the middle of right now. So we started with 80 sites. We define non-responsiveness as not having less than 10 out of 20 patients at the site actually getting any sort of collaborative care life goals program, self-management program. We took those non-responsive sites and we randomized to added external facilitation or external plus internal facilitator. We then waited another six months. If they're still non-responsive, we then randomized them again. And then we followed them for another 12 months. And then we're at the stage now where we're looking at the final data. So it's a very exciting, smart trial. These are fun trials to do. They're also wickedly complex. And that's why I hired a good statistician. So, just some lessons learned and I'll take some questions and answers, but I wanted to just really hone in on a couple things. Implementation science is not just about theory, it's about getting, rolling up your sleeves and getting frontline providers and leadership involved in the line to do some wonderful work. There's also needing to show the return on investment to leadership, that has to happen. Providers and frontline providers are really the leaders here too. They're the ones leading from the middle let them own the quality improvement process and the adaptation. Because letting the other person feel that the idea was his or hers is, one, is a wonderful way of motivation, that's Dale Carnegie. So again, I also have to be humble as a researcher in saying that we know what you don't know. We're not exactly rocket scientists, but hey, you can just keep working with the right people and you can get there. So I'll just, uh, these are my knowledge and, acknowledgements and disclosures and I'll take questions if there's time. Thank you. amazing body of work and it was really interesting to hear about all the things that you guys have gotten done and I'm in the midst of trying to do an implementation type trial right now and, and, and immersed in the challenges and um, so I was wondering I noticed when you were talking about frontline providers you didn't necessarily mean physicians and you kind of toggled back and forth with different people so we're doing um, uh, 
practice facilitation out in the community, so in rural health clinics. And some of the times that we go in, you know, we try to identify a practice champion, and that's generally not the physician. Um, and it varies from practice to practice who that might be. So I'm curious to know your opinion on how important physician engagement is. I have my own opinions about this, but, um, and how you get there. Because when we have a practice champion, a lot of time we, we have to get the permission from the provide the physicians. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times they sort of say, yeah, 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 that sounds like a great idea. Talk to this person. And then yep. they kind of go away. And And my gut feeling is that it's not, good enough to let them go away, but mm -hmm. how do you really keep them engaged in a practical way when they've sort of turfed it to somebody else yep. um, who's equally as important, but they kind of walk, I, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. I think you understand the question. Yeah, there's, that's a really important question about the dynamic between who owns the responsibility and who has the authority on things. I think it's really making sure that the because there's always that, that, that same old story you have, like the clinic leader or physician saying, yeah, yeah, it's great, it's wonderful, go talk to um, so-and-so, they'll get it done for you. And then that person often is not in a loop about the whole process. And so that's who you want to get engaged first and then make sure that it's not a burden to them. And then also use facilitation train and you and consult and coach that frontline provider to be your communicator back to that physician so you're not having to sort of talk to two different people let them do the talking that's what we found in real life but we that happens a lot where you have this kind of voluntold pro problem people get voluntold to do things so you really want to make sure that whoever's been voluntold is actually owning it it's their thing yeah so. Love the work. Uh, have you considered the commercial potential of what you're doing, you know, maybe outside of a healthcare setting, maybe in a for-profit setting? Do you have a sense that organizations would be willing to pay your organization to come in and, and help them implement some, you know, effective practices? Yes, that's a really good question. I think part of it, because a lot of this work was developed in the federal government space, in the VA, there's a limitation about what could be done. I think in terms of the potential for scale up and spread of these implementation strategies, we're seeing that already, and especially with the, the query programs. And the one thing too is I'm not married to necessarily saying the Dadu Repi Dadu facilitation. That bubble diagram was deliberate because there are a variety of different implementation strategies. And my goal is to increase the pie, not sort of thin the slice. So I want people to look at these as as opportunity, you know, there's a lot of work been been done on implementation strategies, and you can learn from that work. That's a good point. Great, great presentation. Um, my question has to do with the sort of organic nature of what you're doing, and so I understand what you're doing still occurs within the research context. So even the non-responders in this trial are, are are clinics or sites who are going to be part of what it, whatever it is that you're proposing or, or have agreed to. How do you organically spread best practice? That is to institutions, so divorced from the research environment. Mm -hmm. How do we sort of move that frontier forward and get changes that way? No, that's a great question. I would say let the health system leadership and that level own the process and buy into, hey, we need to implement these best practices. We need to invest in the quality improvement strategies and the manpower, people power to do the facilitation, the rep. That's really the best way. Um, we're lucky in VA because we have a line of work that's not considered research as long as it's being directed and, and done by VHA clinical operational leadership. And so it never touches an IRB. We work in that space to some extent, but anything we do when we do a lot of extra data collection, I run it through the IRB, and ironically, the University of Michigan IRB considered our ADEPT trial non-research as well. So I think that's, we're still trying to figure out how to play the, in this world, but we, so we like register in clinicaltrials.gov, but we're not a research study, so go figure. But it's, yeah, we're trying to work that part out too, but anyway, so. Great presentation, Amy, thank you. Um, you know, in nursing, when we try to implement things that we know work, mm -hmm on a nursing unit in a hospital, the biggest barrier is lack of time. There's there's mm -hmm. not enough time to do this. There's no one person that can, you know, we, we want a whole, we want all mm -hmm. the staff to implement something. So you talked about de-implementation strategies or how to get things off 
their plates. Could you speak to about that just a little bit? Thanks. Sure. So we have a quarry center in Puget Sound in the Seattle VA that is focused on basically providing audit and feedback and academic detailing to, to basically give providers kind of a, the opportunity to say no to, to ordering a, a test that's not needed. And it's primarily, I'm seeing it primarily with specific um, types of, of clinical interventions such as lung cancer screening follow-ups and things like that that are mainly for physicians. But I'll tell you, to be honest, it's a very new area. It's very new. And I think a lot of it is um, com complicated by, I think, our world of defensive medicine. But it's also complicated by just, oh, we've always done it this way. And, you know, I never, I've always done it this way. So it's, it really takes some more thinking in using quality improvement strategies that use process maps like lean to maybe try to take something off the provider's plate to make things more efficient, as well as using essentially using the uh, audit and feedback to also help with that as well, saying, hey, you know, I notice you are ordering a lot of these tests, you know, you don't need to do that for these situations and giving providers an opportunity to have that, um, for lack of a better term, safe space to say no. So it's, a, it's, it's still an emerging area. We need to do more. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Amy. This is uh, kind of a mechanical question, but each time I looked at this, I, I mean, I see all these names up here and I'm trying to think, if you're thinking about doing a project like this to change with external facilitation and internal facilitation, some practice on average in some general way, how much FTE, external facilitator time, do you need to hire to assist one institution, let's call it a, a, a medical center, a hospital in the VA system for now, mm -hmm. how much FTE uh, time from within that institution do you need to get the uh, medical center director to say, yes, I will protect this amount? Is it yeah. something where you can say, you know, half an FTE for my institution and a, uh, uh, four hours a week from yours and we got this, we got a chance as long as mm -hmm. there's, assuming the stakeholders are interested, or is it really something where you need a full-time person dedicated to it in the institution and a full-time person who's facilitating for the outside? Because if we're going to propose these kinds of projects going forward, we need a little bit of a mm -hmm. kind of a rough sense of what to budget. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the there has been a wonderful article published on how much it costs to use evidence-based quality improvement. That's the most expensive one. That's the lean facilitation training, all that. And I think they costed it out to approximately $100,000 for a visit, not a site, but a visit. That's a Veterans Integrated Service Network. So how many sites are in a visit? I don't know, like six, eight. Yeah. So that's a good rough guesstimate. Um, we haven't done enough work on costing out implementation quality improvement strategies. Essentially, people either throw money at the problem by hiring consultants or you kind of cobble together your own grants. You know, it's really hard to say rep. When CDC did rep, it cost them $400,000 per, intervent $400, per intervention. That was a lot of money. But a lot of that was they costed out federal time, federal employees, everything from emails all the way to actually writing the intervention. So we don't, I don't think I have a precise answer. It depends. But any start, anytime you're doing something for the first time, it's always going to be more expensive. And you want to, I would say rough guess, have like, you know, at least have a full-time coordinator with maybe 20%, I'm just guessing off the top of my head, 20% clinical person in that facility just to jumpstart things. But we found in our facilitation study in re-engage was that the cost actually went down once you took out all the startup costs of building the intervention, adapting it, writing the manuals, writing a training program. Once you kind of get that out of the way as a research unit, the facilitation was not that costly at all. It was like basically like, like about eight hours per site for a six-month dose of facilitation by phone. So those well, are numbers Amy, uh, Thank out. you so much. 